across this great nation. We're getting ready to get started. Welcome to NFRW Empower Hour. I'm Christy Antonick. I am a member of the NFRW Programs Committee and your host tonight for the series that provides in-depth discussions on issues that are forefront across America and the information that you need to speak with authority on important topics in today's political landscape. We've got a great program this month. Whether you have been driving around town, if you've been grocery shopping, or you've dined out, you know that prices are going up, up, and up. So tonight, we're going to talk about policies and regulations that affect inflation, specifically groceries and gas. We have two guest speakers this evening, and they are you're going to be as excited as I am. That's all I'm going to tell you because first of all, I'm going to get to some housekeeping items. Number one, please mute your computers so that we don't have any background noise. Number two, I want to thank Erica Watley and Kim Bowers for their help with IT tonight. Also, we want you to ask your questions. So put your questions into the chat feature. We usually wait to the second half of our program to take questions, but we've got a Congresswoman with us and she's got a tighter schedule. So we will uh, maybe get to some of those questions for her earlier in the program. So last but not least, please remember to tell your clubs and your club members that tonight's program and previous programs are available on the NFRW website in the resource library. We don't want anyone to miss out. So when Glennis and I talked about um, a meeting on inflation, I knew exactly who I wanted to reach out to. Akash Chugali is with the Vice President of Americans for Prosperity, the nation's largest free market grassroots advocacy organization. Previously, he worked on economic Oh, goodness, opportunity initiatives for Stand Together and served as a professional staff member at the Committee on Education and Labor in the U.S. House of Representatives. There he led labor relations and trade issues. If he looks or sounds familiar to you, it's because you've probably heard him on Fox News or Fox Business, C-SPAN, NPR, or a number of other syndicated programs. You may also have read his works in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the New York Post, or you might have seen him, um, his picture when he was selected for Forbes magazine's 30 Under 30 or 40 Under 40. Our second guest has an impressive resume too. Congressman Ashley Henson proudly represents Iowa's 2nd District in Congress. A former award-winning reporter, Ashley knows how to collect stories and how to share them. And we know that so many times it's those stories that actually move policy forward and move our legislators. As a Congresswoman, she is using those stories in DC to help shape uh, federal policy and improve the lives of workers, farmers, veterans, seniors, and families. She is a proud wife and a mother of two. In Congress, she is a common sense leader that pursues pro-growth policies. She is a member of the House uh, Appropriations Committee and the House Budget Committee. I know that you guys know this, that's numbers and that's why we have her on tonight. There she oversees government funding, the government funding process and fights to ensure that every taxpayer dollar is accounted for and spent responsibly. I am so grateful to have Akash and the Congresswoman with us tonight. And I, I just want you guys to take over. We all know everyone on this call and everyone that's going to watch in the upcoming days that regardless of where we go, prices are going up. And I want you to share with our ladies why that's happening and how policy is affecting that. Absolutely. Thanks, Christy. And thanks, everyone, for joining this evening. I know, Congresswoman Henson, you've got a, a tight schedule, so we'll jump right into it. Just really briefly, um, just wanted to say, note, if you're not already familiar with Congresswoman Henson, she's fantastic. Our team at AFP has loved working with her and her staff. And um, just anecdotally, we we're just having a conversation with a couple former members of Congress who were policy champions of ours at AFP. And it's like, you know, who's going to be next? Who's the next kind of policy champion for free markets and can really spread our message and grow our movement? Um, and Congresswoman Henson's name always comes up in these conversations. So we're thrilled to uh, sort of be on the same team with her and, and have her tonight and, and for many ventures that we're taking part with in AFP. So Congresswoman, thanks for joining us. 
Oh, great to be with you. And as you can tell, I am uh, coming to you live from my kitchen <laughs> and my dog is chiming in in the background because um, he's all fired up about uh, what's happening in Washington also. Um, what was it they say, if you want a friend in DC, get a dog. Um, but I certainly have one here in Iowa, but um, I try to be um, in my kitchen at home as much as I can during um, district work weeks. Obviously that's challenging. I have 22 counties, which is about a quarter of the state of Iowa, but um, I am in this fight because of my family, my two boys. Uh, Max and Jax, they're 10 and 12, and the macaroni and cheese pot is just out of frame. Uh, you can't see that. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, I am a per ounce grocery shopper. So I am a believer in um, monitoring how those prices are going up and knowing what I can do as a legislator to try to fix them. Um, I am passionate about reducing our debt, getting our economy back on track. And that's why I love working with organizations like FP, because when it comes to policy, we need actual solutions. We didn't get here overnight. We won't get out of it overnight, but it's my opinion that we have to start somewhere. And that's where it's important to have these conversations. And, um, you know, it, it comes down to opportunity, right? We talk about the next generation having more opportunity than we had. And unfortunately, what we've seen um, in the past couple of years, I think a lot of damage has been done under the Biden administration. It's disadvantaging the next gen rather than setting them up to achieve their own version of the American dream. And so um, that's where I see my role as being invested in this because it's truly my kids that I'm fighting for and that next generation. And uh, that's why we need to be uh, smart about the policies that we're enacting because they do have cause and effect. And I'm looking forward to talking about that more tonight, Akash. Absolutely. So let's start, I guess, just by looking backwards, right? Obviously, we're um, hopeful that you know this Congress has already passed some solutions. There's more to come. But if we look back just less than a year, last summer, we were dealing with gas that in some parts of the country was exceeding $5 a gallon, empty store shelves. I mean, just really concisely, like how did we get there to begin with? High again, energy prices, empty shelves, and high costs elsewhere. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, cause and effect, right? Unfortunately, on day one, the Biden administration went to war on American energy. Um, they enacted policies that uh, made it more and more difficult to get new permits to be able to, to drill and to mine in this country. Um, and really, they doubled down on their obsession with electric vehicles. I am 100% okay with having a conversation about how we are all better stewards of our environment and better stewards of our country. But um, flipping that switch overnight, it devastated our economy. They cut off the Keystone Pipeline, making uh, energy much more expensive. Um, and then, plain and simple, when you you look at inflation and what we're paying at the grocery store, um, if anybody hasn't heard of demand-driven inflation, that's exactly what happened. Um, because they inserted so much spending and so much money, they paid people to stay home, they changed the work requirement on the child tax credit, so checks were just going out to people. And what do people do when they've got more money in their bank account? They spend it and they were spending it fast. And unfortunately, what we saw was that drove up demand, drove up inflation. So those two things together, the energy costs driving up transportation of those goods and services, and then the demand of them together combined um, as a direct result of too much spending and a war on American energy. Absolutely. I think the one other thing that they didn't do was they didn't do anything about the actual problems, right? Supply chain problems, labor shortages. A lot of those things existed before COVID, but if you were looking backwards, obviously you, you kind of touched on this as far as people working and getting people back into the economy. They actually made that problem worse. What could Congress or the administration have done, you know, put aside the energy policy and the spending, but just to get people back off the sidelines, reopen our supply chains a little bit, what could have been done differently in those aspects a couple of years ago? Well, I think when you look at the, the labor force participation data, um, the, the group of people that we need to get back in the workforce, we need a lot more women in the workforce. Um, there is a large chunk of women who um, don't have kids in the house under age 18, unlike my family, you know, where I'm a working mom and I'm trying to manage that. But we need to figure out ways where we can recruit people back into the workforce. The jobs are clearly there. Um, we just need to figure out what that barrier is, um, or maybe non-traditional workers or maybe it's a skills gap, right? Um, and Akash, obviously your background in, in staffing the Edin, uh, we call it the Edin Workforce Committee now, uh, okay. because 
think it is important to focus on workforce. And uh, so some of the policies that I think we should have been focusing on years ago, but I don't think it's too late to focus on them now. Um, how do we focus on, on skills training? Today in my district, I had stops at an apprenticeship program where the employer is actually investing in um, their employees earn while they learn. How can we make shorter term educational opportunities more available to more workers? Uh, maybe a four year degree isn't the answer. Maybe someone just needs a course and a certification and then they can have that job. Um, so that's the kind of policy that I think really will uh, help advance our economy. It's not a handout. Um, it's policy that will help support and advance workforce. Um, skin in the game. Uh, the the uh, the true you know um, engagement in the work you know dignity in the work that people are doing that's the policy that really drives our economy and gets people into the workforce. Absolutely, and I want to circle back on that. That's a very important conversation as far as just policies that create opportunity. Right, they're not always the most hot button issues. They're at the top of the news headlines or defining elections. But as far as actually creating opportunity for people, workforce development is a major one. I remember just in my time on the committee, that was like. It wasn't even necessarily one that I worked on a ton, but was by far and away the most popular issue with members on both sides that they were constantly hearing from businesses that couldn't fill enough jobs. And, um, you know, it's always a problem. But then during COVID, when you had all these other issues going on, it just exacerbated the high costs and, you know, empty shelves and things like that, because there simply weren't enough people to do the things necessary so that we had full shelves and all of that. Was that something you were feeling and hearing from constituents as far as the labor shortage contributed it being a problem and contributing to other problems during that time? Yes, absolutely. And I think, first of all, let me say this, Iowa, the great state of Iowa and our great governor, Kim Reynolds, we were open, uh, open for business. And when you look at our recovery and our bounce back after the pandemic versus some of these other states, which even now still have some restrictions in place, um, boy, what damage that did um, to, to keep those states closed. Iowa, uh, we had a lot of essential businesses and so our people showed up, they went back to work. As a result, our state is in great fiscal shape. They were able to actually do another tax cut and return more of those dollars back to Iowans. Um, and, and you look at our economy, it's roaring here in Iowa. Uh, we have um, jobs in search of people, which is still a problem obviously across the country, but it's because our businesses are growing and expanding the right way. Um, so I'd like to point out and thank our governor for, for what she did to make sure we were one of those states. We always like to joke, we're the Florida of the North. Um, so we, we did our, our part here to stay open. But when you look at the economy and um, what that damage did, um, it really changed uh, hearts and minds around the country about work. Um, a lot of people didn't have that drive. And I think we have to reignite, we have to reignite that spark um, in many, many places. Um, sometimes that means um, requirements associated with a policy. Um, one of the, the Pell Grant opportunities that I'm looking at expanding is uh, laying out some, some, sorry, my dog's over there, <laughs> um, laying out some, some very strict, you know, guidelines for what the policy, what the um, what the uh, help would actually do, but then actually making sure that person is in the pipeline after they're done, um, and that's really important. The skin in the game for the little bit of step up, I think, is really really important. Um, and again, you, sorry, my dog. I'm sorry. This is live TV, is the way I look at it. Um, but uh, you look at. Um, policies like um, like flexibility for employers, right? So making sure that an employer can offer a training, not through a mandate, but offer a training, that's really, really important. So um, with that, I'll stop for a second so I can yell at my dog and I'll let you talk, Akash, for just a second. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Um, again, that that's, just, that's not a new problem, right? It was just one that got worse during COVID, as the Congressman mentioned, we were paying people to, to, to stay home and states were obviously making that way worse with the shutdowns and state policies. Iowa certainly wasn't one of those states that was just piling on money. Um, but above the baseline over the last two years, we spent an additional $5 trillion. I mean, I'm sure all of us have been doing this long enough that we remember when we used to deal in billions or tens of billions or hundreds of billions. Um, just by way of, of context, if you remember during the Obamacare debate, that was like in the hundreds of billions, right? And that was a fundamentally transformative piece of legislation. We've now passed multiple pieces of legislation over the last three years um, that were each around $2 trillion. So that alone, um, Congressman, could you really just, maybe you touch on it a little bit, but for the average person who's not following Washington that closely, the trillion number is like so abstract and it seems so far away and Washington seems like it doesn't really matter, frankly, to the average American's day to day life. How does spending five trillion dollars make things more expensive when they go to the, the drugstore or the grocery store down the street? 
it's it's again cause and effect you insert that much capital into the economy it's going to drive demand it's dri driving again a, a lot of those spending packages including the the um the american rescue plan if you wanted to call it that uh spent trillions and trillions of dollars sending checks out to the american people so right there that that made inflation heat up overnight um and you can see a direct line where that started right when joe biden took over you can see that inflation just took off that correlates with the spending coming out of Congress. Um, and I, I was proud to vote against trillions and trillions of dollars in spending. And I think what people don't understand is that it's 12 zeros in a trillion, 12. And um, my, uh, my youngest son, when I was trying to explain to him, I was like, do you understand how many matchbox cars that is? Because they think of a matchbox car as being a dollar, right? So I was like, that'd be 1.2 trillion matchbox cars. Do you know how many that is? So it's really about putting that in context for people about just how much money the government was spending. That doesn't mean that we can't make targeted investments. As a member of the Appropriations Committee, I am passionate about the oversight that comes with that. Ta uh, taxpayers send their dollars into the federal government and they expect something in return for that. Services that are provided um, of the basic inherent public interest is what the federal government should be doing. Um, but that's why I think it's really important that Congress does have the power of the purse. We are able to be the ones who are uh, putting that filter on and, and doing that deep dive. But these bills were so massive and they spent so much money um, it was just reckless and irresponsible. And so that's why I voted against them. And I think that it's very clearly created more trouble than it was worth to even invest in these policies. One, one last quick note as we look backwards, and I want to pivot to what Republicans are doing now. Um, but not all Republicans have been saints. And Congresswoman Hinson is one of the exceptions here where a couple of these bills were, were completely partisan, right? It was all Democrat votes, no Republican votes. But there were a couple of these along the way um, that had a bunch of Republicans vote for them. And, and time and again, Congresswoman Hinson oftentimes took tough votes, depending on what her district looks like or what others in the party were doing uh, to say no. And so, you know, I, I think folks on this call should know that that didn't go unnoticed and unappreciated. Obviously, you know, the worst excesses of the Biden administration, obviously every Republican was opposed, but um, some of the less bad things, some Republicans were, were okay with, and Congresswoman Henson um, really just took a stand. But as we, as we look forward and sort of from January to where we are now, um, Republicans came in, obviously, a, a narrower majority, and we'll touch on why the election was a little bit of a disappointment, but ultimately took over the House um, of, of Representatives. They just recently, you all just recently passed H.R. 1. Can you answer two questions? One, what is the significance of it being called H.R. 1? And then two, what was H.R. 1, broadly speaking, what did it hope to accomplish? Okay, so H.R. 1, uh, let's talk about the number, number one. It's our number one priority in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, when you look at uh, the bill numbers that, you, you know, sometimes you'll get a, a alert about a bill that's coming in through Congress, and it might be H.R. 4 something, H.R. 592. H.R. 1 is our number one priority, um, and that was American energy. Because we saw, again, the Biden administration just go so all in on the Green New Deal and climate and ESG, uh, environmental, social and governance initiatives, that it is putting such a huge cost on Americans. Some of that's on the businesses through regulatory uh, overreach. Um, some of that is just through uh, executive order uh, policies that make it harder, again, to, to go through the process of getting a permit um, and directives to these agencies to slow walk this stuff. Um, I look at it like uh, the permitting process, for example, if uh, the, the road to energy uh, free flow and good energy flow is your freeway and everything's moving right, the on-ramp is the permitting process that you use to get there. This administration put every single roadblock possible up on that on-ramp to get on and then wants to fine you for sitting there with your turn signal on to get on the interstate. So um, our, our HR1 was the answer to all of this, right? It was let's open up energy independence here in the United States. Let's make sure we aren't putting... Uh, over-regulation on these companies that are trying to use our abundant natural resources and are doing so in a way that is so much cleaner than some of these other giant countries like China, um, Venezuela, dirty oil coming from these other states that dictators run. Um, so we need to be focused on producing that energy here at home. Permitting reform, when you look at um, some of the, the barriers that we faced, again, it is so time consuming and costly to get permits to move forward with this. We wanted to reform that process. Um, and then you look at mining. Um, in this country, 
uh, we have abundant natural resources and we have again become so reliant on foreign countries like China, um, and especially with the policies that this administration is pushing for electric vehicles, we're setting ourselves up for a major crisis in just a few years. So that's why we presented HR1. It's to challenge the Biden administration to lower energy costs for all Americans, provide that innovation in this space, provide uh, again relief on the regulatory side, and move this country forward. One of the biggest drivers of inflation is energy costs. So that was our answer, and we think it's a good solution. We sent it over to the Senate, and um, I think it's time that Senator Schumer puts it on the floor because I think it would pass in the Senate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, a great bill. I, I'd make two points. So one, AFP is going to be putting pressure on a bunch of these Democratic senators. As we speak, we have ads running in states like West Virginia, Montana, et cetera, who are, are likely going to have tough elections next year. Uh, we want this to be a defining issue, just like they made it HR1. Um, this is an issue that touches every family, every business. HR1 is a great solution to an all of the above uh, you know, energy policy. The last point I'd make really quickly on energy, I always laugh at sort of what the Biden administration thought they were accomplishing and then what they actually did accomplish, which is they thought they were actually pushing clean energy and green energy and all this other stuff. What they were actually just doing is pushing demand for fossil fuels to other places, but not actually reducing the demand, right? They were just pulling it out of our strategic production reserve, which you'll recall is meant for wartime, or they were going around begging Venezuela, Saudi Arabia to increase their domestic and, or, you know, their, their fossil fuel production. And so it was the same forms of energy. It was just coming uh, from Venezuela instead of from Pennsylvania or from Texas. And in coming from Venezuela, we're not only enriching countries that hate us, it's also countries that develop energy dirtier and more unsafely than we do. So really just ironic and a failure that HR1 kind of sets right. Um, and you look at what uh, the OPEC uh, countries just did, right? So they we have become so reliant now and at the whim of these countries and these cartels, literally, who are controlling our energy costs. Um, all they have to do is flip a switch and it's painful for the American people. And that's exactly the position they want to be in. Uh, three years ago, we were energy independent and we were a net exporter of energy. So that's a prime example of how that policy can truly impact global competitiveness, but also the geopolitical environment around the world, right? When you look at all of these conflicts that are happening around the world, the fight at the end of the day is really going to be about energy. Who can sustain their country? Who can sustain during a conflict? How can we be energy independent? Because that is truly national security. Yeah, absolutely. And so energy, I think obviously the Republicans have done a great job. On the spending side, how do we write the ship? You're obviously involved in this process. Like, principle number one, obviously, is do no harm, which just in divided government, I think that's a, that's a fair assumption. But how do we actually make things better, not just in the short run, but long term, what needs to happen to get the spending under control? Yeah. So I think the first step this year is to to reel in the spending. We're in divided government. Uh, so we're being realistic about that. We're going to have to come to conference and get something that's going to pass the Senate as well, which is Democrat controlled. So in our mind, the first step as a Republican controlled house is to stop these trillion, trillion dollar packages that are going through. So um, that's the first step. Um, lowering inflation through these other policies, I think, is the other way. You create opportunity um, for people that will help uh, bring in dollars. And then we can, in instead of spending those dollars, apply them toward debt. So that's our, uh, I guess, first step. Long term, we do have to take a look at these programs that are, we call them required or mandatory spending programs because they've been on autopilot. Um, and they are the most costly part of the budget. Um, it's going to have to be something that's done in a bipartisan way because it, it, they, they are tough conversations and they are tough issues. But um, I've been a very, very big proponent of maintaining benefits for Social Security participants because I think that's important. People who paid into it um, need to know that those benefits are there. They earned them and they need to know that. Um, but I look at my generation. I'm 39 years old. Um, I'll be 40 this year. So I'm closer to 40 than I am to 39. But um, I look at that and I'm like, oh my goodness, millennials are not saving money. Um, we are going to face, if we don't take care of these problems long-term for, for my generation, the millennial generation, we are going to have a whole additional crisis in 30 to 40 years when all of a sudden we're of the retirement age and we're realizing, oh, people don't have any money and people don't have any savings and maybe that safety net isn't what they were expecting. So I think that's why it's our duty as members of Congress to step up and do that. Um, and I, I realize it's tough conversations, but again, I think we can be smart about it, protect benefits, but it's going to take us coming together and actually working on it with both parties. And um, I'm hopeful we'll be able to do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. So many even Republicans are, are afraid to mention the fact that these entitlement programs have to be addressed. But the fact of the matter is, if you're for the status quo, if you say you don't want to do anything on Medicare Social Security, there are automatic cuts currently right. written into the law in both of these programs right now. Within the next 10 years, if we don't do anything to improve their fiscal situation, there are automatic cuts to benefits for Social Security and Medicare dependents already written into the law. And so what Congressman Hinton is talking about is we can preserve benefits for people who are currently on these programs or even nearing being on these programs. But then when you get down to the millennial generation, younger than them, we can we can reform the program today for their generation to keep them solvent. Um, and I think it, it really takes takes some courage to do that. I guess sort of pivoting to you know your con conversations with their constituents and even the political challenges, right? I mean. How do you broach that? That, as you mentioned, is a very difficult political sort of landmine that a lot of members are afraid of. Um, you're not afraid of addressing that. How have you found it to be effective to address the importance of doing that and still feeling like, you know, for them to feel like you're on their side? Yeah, well, unfortunately, it is uh, an issue that uh, certain organizations have used as a wedge issue to get people all fired up and fear mongering uh, is uh, an issue that surrounds this. And unfortunately, that doesn't do any good in this in this spectrum. And, um, you know, I'm a I'm a pragmatic lawmaker. I have to look at the things in the black and white here. And and we are facing a, a devastating cliff, like you said, in uh, just a few short years. If we don't do anything, they will see. I think it's like just over 70 percent of benefits is all they'll get if we don't do anything long term. Um, so unfortunately, uh, there are groups that have actually mobilized on this as a campaign issue against members like myself, uh, because I maybe answered one question in a town hall about it, right? And that's unfortunate um, in the political process. So all I can do, no matter what the issue, whether it's this or, um, you know, last year we had, again, all these packages that included a lot of provisions. There was a provision in there to cap insulin prices um, at $35. Uh, I voted against that larger package. I understand I want to make sure people get uh, insulin that's affordable, but all an insulin cap price uh, price cap did was transfer that cost to everyone else, right? It didn't do anything to actually address through a policy initiative, competition, uh, transparency on ma manufacturers. How can we actually lower that price for everyone? So there are a lot of sensitive issues where people get a lot of misinformation. And so all I can do is remain cool, calm and collected, speak to groups like this who can get the message out that we really have the best interests of people in mind here. We wanna have these conversations in a cool, calm and collected way um, because that's really, it's responsible governing. And we have seen both parties and I, I want to be very clear about this, over the last several decades, both parties have been irresponsible here in not dealing with it. Um, I was at uh, the, the Reagan Library last week um, and had a chance to go through, and um, even President Reagan was trying to deal with this um, all, almost 40 years ago now. So um, this is something that Congress can no longer kick the can down the road, and um, I would hope that uh, some of these organizations would take this seriously and not fear monger. We've got just a couple minutes left, and I want to stay on the politics for, for two reasons. One, um, you're in Iowa. Iowa is going to be the center of the universe for the next, you know, 10 months or whatever. Um, and also because I don't know if people know this, but you actually flipped a district. You beat an incumbent Democratic congresswoman, um, and then obviously were, were reelected last year. Um, Republicans, by and large, kind of underperformed. I think, obviously, there were a lot of winnable races that, that Republicans lost, both on the House and the Senate side. We saw good candidates win elections, even in tough environments. In other instances, what are the issues? And I think part of the challenge, Congresswoman, is issues that excite like base Republican voters, activists like us who are involved, they're not always the issues that the swing voters are motivated by. And so what have you found to be kind of a formula that works, that both, both excites your most loyal supporters, but then the issues that win over the people you need to get to 51% or 50% plus one to win elections? Yeah, well, it was exciting to be able to flip a seat in 2020 and then and then hold it last year and actually increase my margin a little bit. So that was really uh, a good thing to to get out there and, and work really hard and earn those votes. And that's the way I look at every election. That's why I work hard to recruit candidates who will work hard, but also have the same kind of policy filter that I do that that want to tackle these issues in a pragmatic way long term. So, um, you know, I think it comes down to finding those kitchen table pocketbook issues. That's what people care about, uh, regardless of if it's our base or independent voters or even to flip a Democrat district, which it was when I first won. You got to have Democrats who are excited about you, too. Um, and I think there are enough people, when I spoke to people about the destructive policies facing this country, about the, the, um, 
the danger that spending too much money and raising taxes puts on the American economy. Uh, when I had those conversations, um, I, I, I think that really excited people. And so that's what I've really been focused on in communicating, whether it was to Republicans. Um, and I am a member of the Iowa Federation of Republican Women, so I should just put that out there. Um, but, um, you know, whether it's Republicans or swing voters or swing suburban women like me, um, that's the issue, those pocketbook kitchen table issues. Um, last campaign cycle, I did a, a town hall at a gas station. I went to the gas station in the morning, spoke to a group of people, and then I went out to pumps and I started talking to people. What does this mean for you? What does this impact have on your life? And the stories that I got from those town halls, um, people want to tell you their story because they're fed up with that, right? They're tired of paying too much at the pump because guess what? It means they have to pick up extra shifts as they're driving their kids all over to be able to pay for gas and still meet their obligations at home. So th that's the real world impact. And people want someone who's going to understand that, who gets the context of their situation and is going to fight for them. And so that's uh, what I tried to do. And I think it was successful. And so now I'm working on supporting other candidates, hopefully a lot of other women who want to step up and run, but other candidates who think that same way. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned the, the gas station event. I know, I think you did with AFP. We were doing these all over the country last year where AFP was actually partnering with local, like sort of independent gas stations and we would pay down the price from whatever it was to what it was the day President Biden took office, which was $2.38, which yep. got a lot more expensive for our organization as the year went on. <laughs> um, but it gave members like Congressman Hinson a chance to hear from people and, and share policy solutions and things like that. Um, I think what two last questions for you, and I know you got to jump here in just a minute, but you're in Iowa, every presidential candidate's gonna come through there. The, the women on this call are from all over the country and they're gonna be meeting presidential candidates, congressional candidates, and so on, what are the things that they should be asking candidates and the things that they should be looking for for somebody who not just believes in what they believe in? So what are kind of the, the, the core beliefs they should be looking for? And then kind of the qualities and strategies that they should be demanding of people who can win elections and flip seats like you did so we can really grow our movement and grow the party. Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, transparency and accessibility are really, really important, um, especially when I look at the state of Iowa and the process we go through to vet our candidates. I mean, everybody comes here and I, I remind people of this all the time. Uh, about three and a half years ago, President Biden was sitting in someone's basement here in Iowa having a beer with them watching a basketball game. So I think Iowans and Americans in general value someone who they know is real someone who they know isn't faking it for, uh, who isn't a political consultant driven candidate, um, someone who they know is the real deal. I think authenticity is really important. So that's what I always look for in a candidate first and foremost. Um, second, ask a question that is that matters to your heart. Um, because I think that too often we listen to the pundits on the 24 hour news, uh, the cable news that goes all and all, all day and it's on repeat over and over and over again. And it gets people drummed up, but is that really what matters to you? Um, and I think that that's where I look at, you know, what I hear from my constituents, it may not be what's on the 24 hour news cycle, but it may be something that is uh, impacting their daily life that's pretty simple and you can tell a lot by a candidates answer what kind of legislator they're going to be or what kind of leader they're going to be so that's what I would say, um, in terms of how I would frame asking questions, um, and, and don't be afraid right? Don't be afraid to ask what you're thinking. Um, I think that we value uh, open and honest discussion in this country. And if we're going to move forward and get the right person in the White House, I might add President Biden's at a 30% approval rating here in Iowa, so we don't like him very much here. But um, I, I think we need a change in the White House and going on record and, and having a stand on these issues is going to be very important. Absolutely. And last question for you. Um, you. You touched on progressive groups have always been very good at sort of like activating people, right? They've got dis different special interests and like their philosophy by nature involves government power. So it's very easy to engage their people into being involved in politics and policy fights. Our side has always had a little bit more of a challenge with that. That's something AFP is trying to address. We've, we've been doing this for a long time, doing grassroots advocacy, right? We have field offices in Iowa and 38 states across the country. Um, not just pushing policy solutions, but actually like activating and empowering people um, to knock doors, make phone calls, talk to their friends and neighbors, hold their lawmakers accountable. Um, that seems like it's becoming more important. So what would be your message to somebody maybe on this call or folks that people on this call talk to who are aligned, they're conservative, but they don't really currently get involved? Why is it important to do that, especially over the next two years with, you know, with a group like AFP? 
Well, I think, um, first of all, let me say AFP has done amazing work in my district and around the state of Iowa. Um, when I look at the, not only the policy work that I've been able to do with the official team, but the, the campaign grassroots side as well, what you've done in this state, you've educated people, you've engaged people. And when I look at what that does for, uh, you know, a campaign like mine, where we are fighting against a lot of those progressive groups, it's, it's truly, it peels back the curtain and people can call a spade a spade when they see something that way. And I think that's really, really important. So what I would say to people who are maybe on the call who haven't engaged, I mean, obviously National Federation of Republican Women does a lot of engagement too. Um, I know many members here in Iowa have been out knocking doors and making phone calls for me um, and, and really helping me too. But I would say uh, the good old phone a friend and don't be afraid to go to an event. Um, AFP hosts a number of events that I know are happening in my district and others around the country. Go to an event, um, bring a friend, and then go to town halls if your representative has them um, and come armed with questions. AFP is a good, has a, a lot of material to make sure that you come armed with good questions to ask, ask too. I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I would say is um, don't be afraid to, to reach out to our offices to find out where we stand on a vote. Um, that's our job. Uh, we have a number of people on a dedicated policy team who are there to answer those questions. And, and then that can better arm you with context for countering misinformation also. So I think that's really, all of those things are the soup of how we're going to be successful in 2024. Because if we don't engage, the other side will out-engage us. Um, they'll out-fundraise us. They usually do. Um, and so that's where we have to we have to counter through good information and activism on the grassroots level. Absolutely. Well, Congressman, we so appreciate your time this evening. Obviously, you've got a busy couple of weeks back in the district, the 22 county tour that she was telling us about um, once you jumped on. But any closing closing thoughts, closing words for the, what the rest of this Congress will look like for Republican leadership in the House of Representatives and things you're hoping to get across to the country? Well, I would just say I think that we there's a reason why the American people gave us the gavels in the House of Representatives. It was because they were tired of overspending and over-regulatory environments and, and just tired of the overreach of government. And so I think we take that as a House majority very, very seriously. Um, we need to make sure we win the Senate and the White House so that we can actually govern um, and move policy that actually will help our country forward. But we've already gotten some wins. Um, I don't know if any of you saw, but President Biden did sign the end to the COVID emergency. But that's because we in the House put pressure on the Senate. The Senate passed it. Even though President Biden said he wasn't going to end it until May 11th, guess where we are? April 11th, and it's already done because we put pressure on. So we need your help, and um, please have our back as we try to take on these challenges because we are fighting uphill against all of those additional forces. But accountability and oversight are absolutely critical, and that's what we're going to be focused on um, going forward. Awesome. That's fantastic. I know I'll, I'll, I'll tackle a few questions here in the next few minutes, but Congresswoman, so appreciate your time, appreciate everything you do, your efforts with AFP and, and fighting for our, our shared values uh, in, on Capitol Hill and, and back in the state of Iowa. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you everybody for having me. Look forward to meeting some of you out on the road eventually. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Representative Hinson. Thank you. So I will, uh, Chrissy, if it's okay with you, I'm happy to just dive into some of these questions um, that are in the chat. We've got like three or four lined up. Absolutely. That's exactly why we have you here because these are difficult topics. And for me, I'm just not a numbers girl. I don't understand a lot about economics. And so I think a lot of our members, we know how to knock on doors. We know how to make phone calls. We know how to get out and go to work for candidates. But when we get into these really in-depth policy conversations, these are a little bit more difficult for us. And that's why we brought you in so that you could guide us here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So let me just reiterate, as far as inflation looking backwards, and I want to get to this question about welfare, the major drivers of inflation were what the Congress would have mentioned. It was two things. It was bad energy policy and absurd overspending. Right? Government has always spent too much money, frankly. The last three years have been far and away. I mean, it just blows out of the water anything we've ever seen in the history of our country. So every industry needs energy, obviously. And so you know, restricting energy drives up costs for businesses. That's going to drive up costs for consumers, dumping money into the economy. There's tons of cash and not enough goods to go around. Of course, the cost of those goods goes up. That's basically what drove inflation. HR1 that the House Republicans passed uh, would free up our energy industry and, and therefore bring down gas prices, bring down inputs for other businesses who produce things in this country. 
um, and getting spending under control is a matter of um, just not doing the reckless things the Democrats did for the last three years. As far as welfare and getting people off the sidelines, there, there's two points I want to make here that are really important. Um, the first is what the problem is and, and kind of why it matters. And the second is how we all as conservatives should talk about it. With welfare, yes, we do spend a lot of money on welfare, but largely the problem isn't just how much we spend, but how these programs are structured. And what I mean by that is instead of being a ladder, too many welfare programs are like a hammock, right? Where people by and large who are on welfare programs, they want what the Congresswoman touched on is, you know, to, to have the dignity of earned success and work and put food on the table for their family. But they, in many instances, they're actually making a financially responsible decision, as sad as it is, to stay on welfare because the welfare programs in a lot of these states are paying them more than even sort of sometimes middle class jobs would pay them. And so, you know, if you've got kids at home or, or you know, frankly, you just don't like the jobs that are offered in your community, especially with the expansions of welfare during COVID, you can make a, you know, a subsistence living being on welfare instead of working. So rather than the money, it's how the program is structured, where there's no step ladder to get back into the economy. One of the things that helps um, helps correct for that are work requirements, right? So Senator Lee, actually next week, is actually just introducing a bill uh, to strengthen the work requirements on SNAP. Um, SNAP is a su supplemental nutrition assistance program. Um, Pretty common sense reform that, for one thing, polls, I think, near 70% approval from the American people, which how many economic policies do you know that have 70% approval these days? Um, but it's because people like the idea of helping downtrodden Americans, but they want to help them get up on their own two feet. And they think government should be designed in a way that helps them do that, and a work requirement does that. So substantively, that's, I think, a really core reform. The other thing we can change is we just have so many different programs, right? We've got food assistance and housing assistance and healthcare assistance through Medicaid. We've got all these things and we spend all these crazy amounts, but they're not at all reflective of what poor people in this country actually want or need. And so one of the things that might make that easier is for these programs to actually be better designed to meet the needs of people to help them get back on their feet rather than just pouring money at them in sort of unlimited means. Um, and, and I see a couple of comments here, right? As far as the, the incentives that are then built in, right? For people that are on welfare, what they're taught, what their children are seeing, right? Children, if they see their parents going to work and having the dignity of earned success are obviously a lot more likely to do that as well. And, and one of the other things our welfare programs do is, is too often they disincentivize marriage, right? They disincentivize work. They disincentivize things that create healthy families and upward mobility. Um, so again, to really just reiterate the, the point of, of how they're structured rather than how much they spend. The, the last thing I would just say really quickly on this um, is how we talk about it as conservatives. The, the, the population we were talk, talking about with the Congresswoman, the, the sort of swing voter who determines who wins elections, Americans are generally compassionate people, right? They wanna help their fellow American. Yes, they're interested in their own well being, but they also wanna lift up people around them who they see struggling. Conversations about poverty and welfare are not conversations about dollars and cents, right? It's a conversation about uplifting your fellow American and what every American needs to thrive in this country, climb the ladder of opportunity, create a better life for their fellow American. These government programs and the welfare spending and the handouts the left constantly pushes, they're actually undignifying for people, right? Even poor people have dignity and they want to climb that ladder of opportunity. Our conservative solutions better empower them to do that. And so that's how I would just recommend framing these conversations around the dignity of the individual more so than just the dollars and cents that are being spent on them. Um, let's see here. So what can, what can be done right now? This is a good question. So um, for one thing, I would, I would say very little in Washington, frankly. I think a lot of our best policy solutions are coming from the states. Iowa is a great leader in this. Florida has been a great leader. Georgia, these conservative run states have, have you know, opened up their economies. They control spending, they cut taxes, they pass right to work laws that um, you know, take the power away from union bosses. So it's attractive for businesses to come and set up shops. So a lot of solutions for one thing I'll say will come from the state level. At the federal level, we can do two things you know, with the House of Representatives under Republican control. 
One is oversight and accountability of the administration. Now, this might seem like it doesn't matter. It's just congressional hearings and people kind of shouting back and forth. Um, but the reason that matters is because a lot of what the Biden administration is doing is being done through federal agencies, right? It's all these executive orders and it's these regulations, it's all the stuff Congress never voted for. But the way you expose what's actually going into those decisions and what the policy impacts of those are is that oversight, right? It's committees writing letters, demanding answers, demanding that administration officials come and testify and answer questions from Congress about these regulations and the economic impacts and what's happening and why these decisions were made so that you, the American people, can actually learn what's going into it and hear the truth from Congress about what Biden and the administration is actually doing. So that's one, I would say, the oversight accountability piece. The other is what they did on HR1, and that's even if it doesn't pass, right? Even if it doesn't pass the Senate, it doesn't get signed by the president, it at least draws a very clear contrast for what a different vision can look like. We have a very clear picture now on energy policy. Here's what a good conservative vision on energy policy looks like. It's HR1, the Lower Energy Costs Act, to contrast to what Biden did. We want that on every single issue. We want that on energy policy. We want that on tax policy, which they're going to tackle over the summer. We want that on labor policy and foreign policy and immigration policy. So even though that doesn't necessarily change the law, it draws a clear contrast that can help us win next year. And then in 2025, of course, hopefully have the opportunity to make major changes to federal legislation in Washington. Schools are fighting a lot. Turn to school. Yeah, so this education, this is a great question. Um, and I actually don't have a ton of expertise here. I used to do a lot of education policy, but the school choice movement has just been going gangbusters. I'm sure many of you have seen this in your state. School choice is not anything new uh, to the conservative movement, right? We've been pushing for this stuff for you know, probably 50 years. Um, but I, I like to say that COVID and the Democrats have done more for the school choice movement even than our own movement was able to do in many years. Um, the gold standard for school choice is what is called education savings accounts. You all have probably heard a child and actually puts the parents in control of those dollars. And so instead of spending that money, just giving it to the school to educate the kid, it actually follows the kid. So if the kid wants to leave that school, go to a private school, get homeschooled, get tutoring, take college classes if they're in high school, whatever that individualized education looks like, education savings accounts empower them to do that. That's something we've been, you know, been supportive of for a long time, but with the school shutdowns during COVID and then people now objecting to what public school curriculums look like increasingly, right? When you've got all this controversial stuff being pumped into public school curriculums, parents are exercising that option where they have it and states where they don't exist are being really aggressive about pursuing them. And so literally just off the top of my head, the last three years, we've had education savings accounts wins in West Virginia, Florida, Iowa, Arizona, and Utah. Five states off the top of my head that have already passed them, signed them into law. And we have many more pushing for them still. Georgia's actively debating this, Texas actively debating this, Arkansas actively debating this. And so if you live in one of these states or, um, you, know, you have Republican legislature as a Republican governor, this should be a super, super high priority because it allows parents to make sure their kids are educated properly, educated in a way that they believe in. They're getting out of unsafe schools. If they're being bullied, if there's special needs and the school is not meeting their needs, education savings accounts are the easy, fastest solution to doing that. And of course, what the Congresswoman touched on, it meets our economic needs too, right? That we will slowly have an education system um, that's more accountable and more meeting the needs of our 21st century economy compared to what we have today uh, in our public schools. Akash, interesting on the ESAs, I am doing two events tonight. We're working on this here with our Empower Hour, but in Texas, they are debating the issue in the House today, but we are having with the Texas, uh, one of our local Republican women's clubs in Waco, we have over 100 people downstairs watching the movie Miss Virginia and then getting a legislative update on ESAs. So it is a hot topic and we hope to get it 
be numbered among those that have already passed that very shortly. But I, I do want to take us back to this. I saw in the chat uh, from North Carolina, they said they are educating their members about their rights to push back, to comment, to ask questions. And that is something that you do and you, AFP does very well. They do grassroots leadership training to, to kind of help people get comfortable with doing this. What can you tell our ladies here across the country that will help them know the right questions to ask, especially on these policies on the inflation factor? Because again, it's just a more difficult topic or maybe not. I, I just think those questions are a little deeper when it comes to policy that affects in, um, inflation. Yeah, absolutely. And so really quick, on the federal register, 100% um, that's a phenomenal level of engagement. Those regulations can be hundreds of pages long and very confusing. And so even a, you know, even a two sentence comment, if you hear about a regulation, Google their, the website of the Department of Labor or the Environmental Protection Agency, whatever. And if there's a proposed regulation, it literally takes a minute. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything academic, doesn't have to be written by a lawyer. But, you know, if you're somebody that does the grocery shopping for your family or you work at a company that's going to be affected or you run a small business, write two sentences about how it's gonna impact your life. They have to read every single one of those. Um, and so don't ever feel like that doesn't make a difference. And then even if the regulation still moves forward, if a regulation is challenged in court or Congress votes to overturn it, all those comments are very valuable and are, are really important inputs. Um, so I, I applaud you for, for doing that in North Carolina. As far as what to do on inflation, Christy's right, the Grassroots Leadership Academy through AFP helps equip uh, equip activists of, of how to be effective advocates and um, how to engage and, and change minds effectively. The questions you should be asking are, I keep going back to energy and spending, right? One, how is this going to actually reduce our energy costs? And then the second is, you know, when somebody proposes a new program, right, is this going to raise our energy costs? And second, is this going to increase spending, increase the debt, or increase our taxes, right? Everything that government promises, no matter how nice it sounds, has to be paid for. And there's basically three ways they do that, right? They can borrow more money, they can take money away from something else, which government never does, right? Government only ever grows, or they can raise taxes. And so there'll be a lot of great promises, right? And they promise free stuff all the time, free benefits, free healthcare, free education. Biden did this student loan bailout thing. Um, Ask those questions because those are the things on the spending side that drive inflation. No matter how nice a promise sounds, if it's going to increase spending, it's going to increase inflation. And so that could be in the form of welfare. It could be corporate subsidies. Like I mentioned, it could be the student loan stuff. Um, those are the really, really core questions. And frankly, the details on a lot of these programs, the details that they'll tell you are the details of how it's going to help people or benefit people, right? If it's a handout or something. But here's the thing, government can never lower costs. Government can only ever hide costs or shift costs to other people. So that's a really, really key point that anytime you're having this debate and they say, oh, you know, this bill will, um, will lower your energy costs by, by giving away a tax credit or having government subsidize people's energy payments or, or whatever the, the case might be, anything that involves more government involvement and they say it's gonna lower costs, it's never lowering costs. It's only masking those costs and making all of us as taxpayers pay for it. And so those are the questions you have to ask. Is this actually lowering costs or is this just government paying for more things? And it's, if, it, if it's government paying for more things, how is it being paid for? Is it tax increases, spending increases, more debt? Because that's how we know energy costs go up and our inflation goes up. Okay, so here's a hard question. How long before we get to see a turnaround? I, I think fairly quickly. I, I would say two things. Um, one, we've already seen it in the states, right? Texas's economy is booming. Florida's economy is booming. Arizona's booming, right? These states that were open, that have low regulations, control their spending, friendly tax environments, friendly labor environments, Iowa's another one, their economies are actually doing quite well. Um, the economies that are doing most poorly that people are leaving or people are moving away from states like New York, Illinois, California. California over the last two years 
lost more than 500,000 people. That is almost an entire congressional district in and of itself that have left the state of California. And where are they going? They're going to Texas, going to Florida, going to Arizona. Um, and it's no secret why they're doing that. And so I think at the state level, we're already seeing it. At the federal level on a sort of national macro scale, um, I think we'll start to see it this year and even next year, not because government does anything, but actually because government does no harm, right? The simple fact of not being able to pass any more $2 trillion spending bills, not being able to place more restrictions on the energy industry, no more inflation reduction act, any of that nonsense that they were doing last Congress, just by nature of government stopping the bad stuff, we'll start to see the economy get a little bit better. Now, I think things are going to get worse before they get better, unfortunately. I think we're seeing gas prices go back up. We could be headed for an economic recession. But all of this is a result of what was done over the last two years, right? It takes a while for economic impacts to unfold of all this spending and regulation. So I think we're in for, for some economic pain, you know, maybe throughout the rest of this year. But then as we start getting out of that, I, I am hopeful that inflation will subside, the inflation or the uh, supply chain crisis will subside. And then when we start getting to 2025, um, when hopefully a new Republican president is able to get rid of those regulations on the energy industry overnight, um, I think that'll really start making a huge difference. And so kind of a long-winded answer to say, look at what's happening at the states, prepare for some short-term pain, for some you know less pain after the end of this year. And then getting into 2025 is where I really think we can hit overdrive on getting the economy going again in a way that works for everyone. Okay, well, I think on that, that's maybe a little better news, although I want you to know I picked up some fingernail polish the other day and I had to look at my ticket when I walked out of the store because I generally pay $8.99 for that fingernail polish. It was $12.99. So I really hope it's not going up anymore. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. And, and, and everything is, right? And that's because all these things, every business has these inputs like energy. They're getting more expensive and labor is getting more expensive. And so that's what we're dealing with. Okay, so I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your time. I know how much knowledge you hold in that brain of yours. I don't always get it, but I am so grateful that you would come on and share with us tonight. It is a difficult topic, but we appreciate your insights and the Congresswoman's insights, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future. I want to say to our ladies who joined us, thank you. I hope you enjoyed our Empower Hour. Next month, uh, May 9th, we will discuss, discuss voter engagement projects with Carl Rove. We hope to see you all there. And again, don't forget that you can go back to the library resources and uh, tell your friends about the programs that we've had in the past and tonight's program. Thank you to all of you and we'll see you next month. Thanks everybody.